So today I want to talk about Messier 106, which is another spiral galaxy. And as you know, they're my favorite. <laughs> so yeah, it's about 22 to 25 million light years away. What is cool about it is that it's what's called a Seifert galaxy. And it's actually the nearest Seifert galaxy to us. So a Seifert galaxy is a class of galaxies with actively growing supermassive black holes. So we think in the center of every galaxy, basically, you have a black hole that sort of sits in the gravitational driving seat, right? And when you look at the light from those galaxies, you'll see that in the center, you get like X-ray radiation and radio radiation as well. That's coming from basically the, the supermassive black hole accreting material. But what ends up happening is that as that material like spirals around the black hole, waiting basically to be accreted, like the pressure in that scenario is like massive, right? And basically the gas heats up due to friction and it like starts to glow in X-rays. And then that X-ray gas can then hit into hydrogen gas. And then it basically excites electrons in the energy levels. So you have like a proton in the center of the nucleus and then you have an electron going around it. Basically, if it gets hit by like X-ray radiation, it'll jump up to the next energy level. And then when it's like, oh, I don't actually want to be up here because this is not the place I'm supposed to live, it drops back down and then it gives off light. And quantum mechanics says that those energy levels are always separated by the same amount of energy. So it always gives off the same amount of energy. So the light is always the same color or wavelength. And so when we look at the spectra of these galaxies, we see these very sharp peaks in the emission. Now we see also that in emission nebula in our own Milky Way galaxy. So this is like star forming regions, you know, like the Orion Nebula. You get the light from star formation also triggering the same process in gases around the nebula and you get emission lines from it. They look a lot different though in this in these Seifert galaxies. So this is a spectrum of the Orion Nebula and you can see that at all the different wavelengths occasionally we get these really sharp peaks of emission and that's from say this one here is from hydrogen okay and a bit of nitrogen mixed in as well so in, in a couple of peaks that sort of blur together but basically that's always at that same wavelength and we see that very 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 clearly now this spectra over here is of one of these Seifert galaxies so it's a different galaxy I couldn't find the specific one for this one straight away but this is for a Seifert galaxy and you'll see it also has the same kind of emission but you can see actually instead of being very sharp peaks these ones are kind of broadened okay they're not as sharp this is sort of like 400 angstroms wide here where before they were only sort of like 10 20 angstroms wide if that in the 1940s when Seifert first looked at this he realized that they were different to the sort of emission nebulae we saw in our own galaxies and that they were this sort of like smeared and broadened out emission and that all comes from the fact that your gas in your galaxy is actually sort of spiraling around the black hole so some of it is coming towards you and some of it is coming away from you and so some of it's red shifted and some of it's blue shifted and so you get this sort of smearing out to different wavelengths as it spirals around the black hole which is like pretty cool right so the reason that i wanted to talk about m106 though is because it contains what we call a mega maser which is like the most astrophysical sounding word I've probably ever come across, right? It's a mega maser quasar. <laughs> Wait, no, I said that wrong. A quasar is the name we give to sort of any growing supermassive black hole, ones that are extremely, extremely bright in like X-rays or radio. So this is a mega maser quasar, which I kind of always want to just push together so that it's just a, a maser <laughs> into, into one word. So maser is actually an acronym for something. And if you're thinking it sounds a lot like laser, you would be right. So a laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And a maser is microwave amplification of, by stimulated emission of radiation. So basically it's the same thing as a laser, but in the microwaves rather than like optical and infrared that we use lasers for every day. So a laser is basically light of all the same wavelength that is very highly like collimated and directional. So it's like all going in exactly the same direction and it's extremely, extremely bright. The same thing is true of, of a maser. It's very collimated, all the same wavelength and very, very directional as well. Emission of light a very specific wavelength. Now that might sound quite similar to what I was describing before in terms of like the emission nebula that we see and this in the emission lines in the Seifert galaxy spectra that we see as well, but it's actually very, very different. So if you have like, imagine sort of like a collection of atoms and particles like hydrogen gas, for example, okay? And you've got, you know, protons with your electrons around them and just hanging out in this hydrogen gas, right? If you put energy onto that gas, there's like one of two things that can happen. So the first one is what we call like 
random spontaneous emission, which is what I described before. Basically energy comes in, randomly causes the electron to jump up to its next energy level, and then it will just spontaneously decide to drop back down again. So it's what we see when we look at the spectra of like nebula and galaxies and stars, everything that tends to be just this spontaneous emission of light from the spontaneous drop down of these electrons. The second thing that can happen though, is that the light comes in, is so energetic that more than half of the atoms in your hydrogen gas have the electrons jump up to the next energy level, right? So you've got like a really sort of loaded gas, right? And what then that means is that more energy is still coming in in the form of like X-ray photons, for example, from you know the gas around the supermassive black hole. And then what can happen is that as that photon comes past the atom of the galaxy with the electron already excited, it actually stimulates the electron to drop back down. And in doing so, the electron gives off light with the same wavelength as the light that came in, and also in the same direction as well. And so you end up with this actual like cascade of light that ends up being very, very directional, so all in the same direction, on all of the same wavelength as well. So it's very collimated like a laser. But with the radiation that's coming off supermassive black holes, they're so energetic that these things are 100 times brighter than anything we see in our own Milky Way, hence Mega Maser. <laughs> So M106's Mega Maser is a H2O vapor Mega Maser, which means it's basically electrons that are excited around water molecules. And all the energy comes from the X-ray radiation from the supermassive black hole. A lot of people have studied M106 with radio telescopes and have tried to observe the spectrum of this emission from this H2O Mega Maser. So there's then two things you can do with your Mega Maser. Mega Maser again. <laughs> So there's two things you can do with your Mega Maser uh, observations. So this one was Mayoshi in 1995, who basically first of all measured the mass of the black hole using one of these masers. So this plot here is the spectrum that they get of this maser in M106. What you can see is that, yeah, it's not one single peak. It's lots of different peaks that are, first of all, well above like the generic sort of level of light you're getting from the galaxy. But they're at all different wavelengths because they've been shifted depending on where they're seen in the galaxy. So there's sort of like different clumps of the gas around the black hole. It's like not like a, a smooth thing. There are clumps that are emitting, um, that have enough energy to produce this mega maser. And so you get the light from these different clumps and all of those are moving at different speeds around the center of the galaxy. And so they're shifted depending on what speed they're moving around the galaxy. So we see all those peaks. So this paper that came out in 1999, they worked out that with this same data, you could actually work out how distant the galaxy was purely from the geometry of where those clumps were around the center of the galaxy. So they have a cool little sort of infographic that you can see here. Here's the same plot that they had in that previous paper, which is just the spectra of light. And basically sort of stuff on this side, you can attribute to clumps of H2O vapor with your mega maser on this side of the galaxy. And stuff on this side is, is these clumps over here. And the bright stuff in the middle is the stuff like sort of right in front of the, the central supermassive black hole. So I think those contours they're showing there are like the X-ray or radio data from the supermassive black hole. And then this is sort of the warped disk model that they've come up with to explain these clumps of these mazes. So if we think about what the geometry of this system actually looks like, right, it would look probably a little bit like this. Okay, so if this is the black hole at the center of the galaxy, right, and you have one of these clumps of like mazar emission over here, that is at a distance r from the center of the galaxy, and possibly it's going round the black hole like that. If we're sort of observing down here, this is my nice eye, on planet Earth, and we're observing that black hole and that mazar, then first of all, it's gonna be at a distance of d away from us, and then also this light here is gonna come up to us in a different angle than d, and so that's gonna be sort of separated on the sky by that angle as well, right? We're also then gonna measure the rotational sort of velocity it's coming towards us at, so this is sort of the velocity that you measure, but in reality it's actually sort of going round at like a rotation velocity like that, which we don't measure. That's also obviously then gonna be at some angle in the galaxy as well. So you've gotta think about like, what we know and what we don't know. So we know the mass of the supermassive black hole from the previous paper. We are trying to find this distance, right? We know this and we know that. Using all of that information and the fact that you've got a load of those different clumps that you can model, you can then use that to cancel out the things you don't know 
and actually find what the distance to the galaxy is, which is how we know that it's like 22 to 25 light years away, which might not sound very precise, but that all depends on you know, what model of the universe you assume as well to do that. Um, but it's actually one of the most accurate measurements of a galaxy we have. Like it's, we know that it's sort of right within like 3% which, I mean, we have measurements that are more accurate than that in our like own local group of galaxies, so the Milky Way, Andromeda, and like the Magellanic Clouds. But outside of that, that's the most accurate distance measure we have. And so these mega mesas are really, really useful in giving us a sort of step on what we call the distance ladder in cosmology, like determining at even greater, greater distances, you know, how do we calibrate redshift with distance in the universe? useful for the observations that we do is to extend that, project that system of longitude and latitude onto the celestial sphere. Expands out, plot every single yeah. integer, negative and positive.